Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. On the 1st of July this year, new industrial manslaughter laws uh, came into force in Victoria that were passed by the Andrews government through the parliament at the end of 2019. The offence carries a maximum fine of $16.5 million for employers and jail terms of up to 20 years and fines of up to $1.65 five million for individuals whose actions or omissions cause the death of a worker or member of the public and involve a breach of an OHH duty through negligence. There have been calls for Victoria's industrial manslaughter laws to be applied against those responsible for setting up and administering the hotel quarantine program with uh, breaches from the program. Uh, it, genomically uh, traced uh, to the second wave infections, which has claimed uh, 800 lives. My guest tonight is Ken Phillips. He's the director of Self-Employed Australia. Uh, he has uh, written, uh, he wrote uh, on the uh, 29th of September to WorkSafe Victoria's enforcement director, uh, requesting that they begin uh, prosecuting uh, proceedings. Ken, welcome to the show. How are you, Tim? Oh, well, I think I'm like most Melburnians doing better. We, we have yeah. some hope now. I, uh, I remember early August when we had that state of disaster, we were waking up every morning to, was it 400, 600, 700 cases? It was almost just like there was no hope. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about when you were watching the P uh, Peter Credlin's documentary last night, but it was sort of like, uh, as I said, uh, reliving the grief of that lockdown experience again. And I think a lot of people are going to want to move on, put it behind them and forget it. And I think politically that's more than likely what the Andrews government is betting on. Uh, there's an election in two years' time and they uh, hope that all this will be well and truly forgotten. Uh, and I'm, I'm like the rest of Mel uh, Melburnians. I, w I want to uh, forget. I don't, uh, don't basically want to... Uh, uh, keep reliving the trauma, but we don't want the people responsible for this preventable second wave uh, to get away with it. And uh, this is what uh, the, the action that uh, you've taken with this uh, letter, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll put up on the screen, you sent it to uh, Work, uh, WorkSafe Victoria Director Gordon Cooper on uh, September 29th. Have you heard back from him? Yes, we, we have, and they have confirmed and said to us that they are investigating, and that's as far as it goes. Uh, they have a statute requirement to reply to us by the 29th of December, and they have to then tell us if they are prosecuting or if they're not prosecuting, why not? And then if they don't prosecute, uh, we are then able to write to the public prosecutor requesting that the public prosecutor uh, undertake prosecution. So there's a series of steps to unfold here. Uh, now, uh, explain how these uh, industrial manslaughter laws uh, uh, were uh, designed to be applied to workplaces and, and companies because uh, Daniel Andrews, he was quite quite keen to, to champion uh, this as a, a, a proud labour union uh, achievement. And as you wrote uh, yourself, he, he didn't expect that uh, his government uh, would be uh, first, f uh, the, the first in the firing line to, for these laws to be applied. Well, let's, let's be specific on, on what Act's being applied and where it is and so forth. The amendment, the, the Industrial manslaughter laws are amendments to the Victorian Occupational Health and Safety Act of 2004. So the, whether or not the manslaughter issues are there or not, there is still a process requiring prosecution under the 2004 Act. Now that Act was the creature of the Brax Labor government. Uh, I consider that Act to be a very good piece of legislation. In actual fact, I consider it to be possibly the best piece of OHS legislation in the country. In my view, it has been quite corrupted by the manslaughter legislation. But let's remember what's actually being applied here is at first base, 
the 2004 Act. Now that Act requires that, and I'll put it in more generic terms than an employer, that an entity is required to conduct a safe worksite. The idea of a worksite has a very broad definition. So for example, if you were walking through a shopping centre and there was a shop being renovated and a live electric wire fell across the outside of the shop and you stood on it and were electrocuted, uh, the very fact that you're outside the shop doesn't absolve the people who are renovating the shop from their obligations. And, and so that's the way it should be. Mm, so, yeah, I agree as well. Yeah. And, and that's absolutely the way it should be. So what we've got is a situation here with the Victorian government, with the uh, health department. Uh, I liken it to a situation preparing for war. And effectively, that's what we're in. We've got this silent thing that we're, that we're at war with. And uh, we spend a huge amount of money on the military to try and ensure that if we are attacked as a nation, that we are in a position to defend ourselves. And we're well and truly, we hope, prepared for that. And we do assessments all the time of what's going on. And the health department in this area is very much like our military forces. These pandemics are not something that is unknown. Uh, it, since the year 2000, there have been a repeat of these sorts of things, SARS and so on and so forth. Uh, the communicable diseases are a known issue. So AIDS, HIV, all sexually transmitted diseases and all the other things, you know, whooping cough, on and on it goes. And the health department is charged uh, with a primary responsibility to be alert to all of this, to be prepared for it, to respond. And that's what we pay an enormous amount of money asking them to do, not asking them to do, requiring them to do. So the arrival of this germ from overseas is not something that was unusual, not something that was unexpected. It falls within all of the parameters of what we know about, about uh, viruses and germs. It's a new one, a big deal. And we knew it was coming. It was in China. We had the uh, federal government repatriating people from Wuhan and putting them into isolation beforehand. So it was clear that the risks and the situation was well known. It was well known how it, this needed to be handled. We had the situation with the Ruby Princess where it was handled badly. So we knew if it wasn't handled correctly, that there would be a breakout. We knew about the uh, ship in Western Australia where there was a similar problem. And so the health department in Victoria was well, had absolute knowledge, months of knowledge about what was coming. And they are supposed to be prepared. So to say that this is something unusual or outside of, of what we understood or, or, or that there were some mistakes made, rubbish, complete and total rubbish. So these people were in charge of this defence. They knew what had to be done. And they did not make mistakes. They fouled up totally and completely and, 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 without, and continued to foul up. It wasn't just one mistake. It was, it was a series of foul ups built on top of each other that kept building and building and building, not just for weeks, but for months before they finally started to react. Now they're turning around and saying, oh, look, let's put that all in the past. Let's forget about it. It was a series of mistakes. Well, I'm sorry, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, these are not acceptable excuses. They were in charge. They said that they were in charge. They recognised that they were in charge. And to turn around and say, en masse, oh, we didn't know what happened. Well, in a court of law, in any other situation, the WorkSafe Authority would have moved in like a battering ram 
and they would have investigated from day one and in my view, prosecutions would be on the go at the moment. We've seen with the, the board of inquiry into the hotel quarantine program, this uh, uh, you've uh, just described that it should be the, the sole responsibility of the health, health department, but we've seen it, it, it basically there's been this cross department, a, well, where they've all been able to basically run cover for each other. That's what it looks because it's, uh, there's health and human services where uh, Jenny McCarkos was the was the minister responsible. Then the Department of Jobs in charge of procurement, uh, headed by Minister Martin Pakula, and then of course the enforcement side, uh, Lisa Neville as the police and emergency management minister. And now we have the the hotel the hotel quarantine. Uh, program in Victoria. It's not receiving international travellers at the moment, but those who can't isolate at home, that's run now run by Attorney General Jill Hennessy's department. So we have this a hu huge web now, which it it it's it makes the job of sort of of uh, workplace uh, work safe uh, Victoria. I mean, where do you start to sort of? I mean, uh, we've we've seen how the hotel quarantine inquiry hasn't got very far where where sh should they start at the beginning day one that um credlon has pointed out in her things that every that's on the on the public record who made the decision to not use the police or the army and start from there this any good investigative journalist is able to follow follow the rabbits down the burrow and we've seen here with the Kate inquiry, a complete failure to follow leads of inquiry. This is what they should be doing. So we've written to the Kate inquiry ourselves. There were a series of emails that are in the evidence in which uh, people who were organizing the quarantine were expressing extreme frustration at the performance of one of the security companies and they said in the emails exchange but we have to keep using them because of trades being trades or council now if that's not a trigger to go and investigate what went on at trades hall council to cause those people in the government to say we're being required to use trades trades hall council we're required to use the people because of trades hall council that should be signaling red flags everywhere there should be a deep dive inquiry into just that area of investigation so this has been created as such a complex se sequence of events of people denying knowledge of what decisions were made and when from the premier through cat everyone we have no idea i'm sorry the work safe authority if if this had been a building that had blown up and killed 800 people and had been on fire for as many months as COVID had been out there, there would be deep dive investigations into every specific detail of what went on, when, how decisions were made, exactly what happened. There is a responsibility under the Act to provide a safe system of work. It is completely demonstrable that this failed on a monumental scale. This was not a safe system of work and the safe system of work continued to be unsafe for a very considerable period of time until and to the extent where the government admitted they could not control the situation. And so therefore they put us all into this big lockdown. Every day of that lockdown was an admission by the government of failure, of failure of safe work systems. And we don't yet have the WorkSafe Authority prosecuting. So where do you start? You start at the beginning and you just keep working and working and working on it. Remember, these are criminal prosecutions. You know, it's the same situation. You get a, a murder mystery. Uh, several people have been murdered in a house. We don't know what went on. Where do the forensic analysis go? They start at the beginning and they work through each piece of forensic information and they gather it all together until they can form a picture. There is a picture to be formed here as to why the decisions were made, how they were made 
and and what the, the breakdown in the systems of work were and who is responsible, all the people and the departments and the entities that are responsible for that. There is a picture, there is a story to be told and it has to be brought out because if you don't bring this out, this will be repeated. That's the issue. And we've heard uh, Daniel Andrews say by by next month that he uh, wants to resume uh, inter international arrivals, and well, we still have we we'll wait to see the interim report on Friday. Uh, what what that says from from Justice Coate, uh, you would hope that there's going to be more scrutiny on uh, the program this time from the media than there was last time, but nobody could have guessed how just how as you said things compounded it was not just the the first there was the breaches in the the program but then of course we've seen the the poor contact tracing as well not using a digit a digitized system but the obviously as if this was a if this was happening in a, in a private company the the book would be thrown thrown at them but the thing and this is not unique to the andrews government but governments constantly get away with uh, doing things of malpractice that wouldn't uh, uh, that would see a private company go into liquidation and this is another uh, it, uh, this problem is here as well well, we can't accept that as an excuse. Oh, I'm not, but I'm just no, saying no, that I'm, this is what I'm, I'm not. But we as a community can't accept that as, a, as an excuse. We have to have a gov... If, if we had a foreign power invade Australia, a, a mythical foreign power, and crash in and, and, and start bombing Sydney and Melbourne and everywhere else, uh, the generals who didn't foresee this and who didn't have things in place to stop it would be sacked very quickly. Uh, you, you cannot accept this from a government. There cannot be one rule for the ruled and another rule for the rulers. That's not a democracy. That's not a civilised society. That is a dictatorship under any name. And it is the folly of humans when we organise as a society to have a situation where people who obtain power work towards a situation where they are not responsible for their actions. Now, fortunately, we've got some situations operating the reverse. We had the scandal with the uh, cessation of the live meat trade into Indonesia and the court ruling that held the government responsible. And it's fantastic to see the government standing up to its responsibilities and accepting that. And the standard that we have to have in our society is that no one is immune from the law. If, if any one of the responsible officers or ministers or anyone had been in a bus driving a bus with a whole lot of school kids in the back and had crashed the bus and killed a whole lot of the school kids, we'd be screaming for blood and they'd, they'd, be, they'd be prosecuted. There is no difference. There is no difference. As we come out of this lockdown now, uh, there, there, there are a lot of uh, lawsuits uh, pending against the lockdown. Uh, I just mentioned in my introduction the, the challenge to the curfew knocked back by the Supreme Court. We have a high court challenge to the, the five kilometre radius that's being heard later this month. There's also uh, Jim Penman of uh, Jim's uh, mowing his cl class action as well, and there's a whole bunch of other ones uh as well uh obviously your if your uh request well it's not a a legal action but it's 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 something that you want uh, work safe to to look at uh the obviously with the decision today uh, 
it, uh, it ruled in favour of the government. That's my feeling is that most of the time, especially the courts in Victoria and the authorities are, in Victoria are always going to rule with the either the government or the police. I mean, we saw with the, the George Pell uh, prosecution and conviction, it took the High Court to overturn that. So do you, you still have confidence that what you're uh, pursuing through WorkSafe will get somewhere, given what we've seen as the state of justice in Victoria? Major concern. Uh, even if you put the Pell case aside, there are a number of OHS prosecutions that occurred in Victoria where the parties prosecuted, the businesses prosecuted, were demonstrably not even involved in the incidents, were prosecuted, convicted, uh, found guilty in the full, uh, the full bench of the Supreme Court and like the Pell case was overturned totally at the High Court. Uh, there is a, seems to me, a process that occurs too often and there, this is well documented by lawyers where it looks like the system of justice could be even defined, identified as a system of winks and nudges. That someone goes down, not because of what they did or did not do, but because of who they are or whose nose they've got out of joint. Conversely, people who should be prosecuted uh, seem to be in the right camps and are left alone. So I, I, I'm of the view that we have got a considerable problem in Victoria. The system of justice is of enormous concern and the only power that we the people have is to get out there and talk about it and ultimately to consider what we do with our votes. Do you think these industrial manslaughter laws and the possible uh, prosecution that Andrews is government and bureaucrats could face, do you think that's genuinely concerning him and has influenced uh, his uh, decision to basically go for an elimination strategy, which uh, looks it looks like it's it's going to get there if the numbers keep uh, getting to zero and he's been so, uh, you would say, stubborn in saying that we, we've got to just, the, the, the memes have all been, oh, we've just got to have a few more weeks, uh, shut down for a bit longer and that. What's your thoughts on how much that is playing on his mind? Well, um, I'm actually probably a contrarian, contrarian on this from what you would think. And uh, my view is that, it, unfortunately, the lockdown was required. Uh, it was required because of the complete and total failure of the systems of government. And they have to be held responsible for that. But effectively, what the government did was admit that they had total failure. And so therefore, the only option that they had was to lock us all in our rooms like naughty school children. Now then when they applied that, they applied it in a completely inconsistent manner. And so we find that we had Jim's mowing people, for example, independent contractors banned from working. But you could walk into any one of the gardens in the city and find council employee gardeners merrily doing their job. We find the we're all in this together theme. Well, no, we're not in all this together. The small businesses and the business uh, and in particular retail and hospitality crashed into nothingness. And yet they turn around and they give all the public servants a 2% pay rise. So what we've got here is a process of dividing the society, an intentional process of dividing society. In other words, the pain, the financial pain, the emotional pain, and the, the psychological pain has been suffered by one specific sector of society. 
people in business for themselves, employees, workers, the public service, all the unions, uh, protected entities. So what we've got here is a, a lockdown because of the failure of the government, a, a government that made us all unsafe, that then locked us in our rooms like little children, told us to behave and that we were being naughty. The people who were being naughty all the time was the government itself. What we've got in play here is, a, is the politics of Stockholm Syndrome, where the people who have been locked up feel empathy and sympathy and are grateful to the people who locked them up because they're now keeping us safe. But what we have to remember here is that we were unsafe because of the unsafe behaviours of the government itself. So was the lockdown necessary? necessary? Unfortunately, yes, but because of the failures and the unsafe practices of, of the government. That's why the OHS prosecution has to proceed. Well, we are the only state or territory in Australia to experience a, a second wave. And going back to what, what you said, uh, I remember uh, Dan lecturing and hectoring us. He tried to blame uh, the, the spiking cases in June on, on families uh, getting together and uh, people not following the rules. Well, we know uh, it, it, where uh, the, the spike came from now, uh, but uh, you're absolutely right about the, the inconsistency of the industry restrictions when it came to, to stage four. Construction was hardly touched and even though John Setka is uh, head of the, the the secretary of the CFMEU in Victoria, even though he's officially out of the, the Labor Party, is still very uh, influential and uh, just to take a isolated example, when uh, uh, Dan introduced the the fitted uh, face mask requirement, uh, there was a last minute change which allowed the uh, the gaiters which the uh, construction workers wear, uh, which who lobbied for that last minute change. Well, it, the, the whole thing's just riddled with inconsistencies, and the whole thing's riddled with unfairness, and and. Really, the, the point that the people have to remember, and we just keep coming back to this the whole time, it was the unsafe practices of the government that put us all at risk, that created a safety issue for all of us. Their only response was to lock us all down. And every day that we were locked down was a demonstration that these people couldn't cope. It was a further demonstration that these people in the government need to be prosecuted. But that's where we stand and that's where we have to move forward. Uh, let us hope, let us hope that, and on, on uh, Peter Credlin's expose the other night, there were people who referred to the government's mistakes. Let us hope that they have learned from their mistakes. Well, these weren't mistakes. These were conscious decisions made about how they would manage or mismanage the hotel quarantine and subsequent processes. These weren't mistakes. These people were making conscious decisions on a consistent basis about how they would manage this situation. I don't think it's mistakes. Let us hope that they have stopped mismanaging. When one looks at the press conferences that are going on, you can see, I think, a subtle shift in who might seem to be in control now. There seem to be more, other people who have taken control, even though they may not officially have taken control. So let us hope that they are on top of the contact tracing. Uh, let us hope that they've got this stuff under control now and that they do have proper management systems in place. So pray, I'd have to say. <laughs> Right. Well, I've seen on the, the bureaucracy side, uh, Anna, Annalise Van Diemen, who was the Deputy Chief Health Officer, she was moved sideways and is now doing other work. And so Alan Chang is the, the new uh, Deputy Chief Health Officer. He doesn't seem to have 
any baggage from anywhere and we we see on the 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 da- we have seen on the daily press conferences the new contact tracing head jerome uh weimar uh, t- uh go into to detail about uh, what they do and t- as you were were saying to pr- what Obviously, they coordinated these press conferences to project more competence. Well, I, I think there is some hope that that competence is there. Uh, we, it, it all, I, I get information for, like a lot of us do. I get information about what's going on, right? Some, and things, thing, information leaks to me. The contact trace, sorry, the, the, uh, testing seems to be up to scratch. They now are getting the test results within a matter of, I believe, 48 hours. Remember, we had a situation in which people were being tested and uh, they were not getting results for seven days. They were not getting contacted for seven days. So imagine if you've had a test and you're sitting at home in in some sort of lockdown situation and and, and and waiting for a result, you don't get a phone call. And so therefore you go, well, maybe I'm okay. I don't know, I've got to go and get food, right? So out you go. And, and that sort of mismanagement, gross mismanagement of what should have been pretty basic stuff uh, seems to have stopped. So it seems that people are getting contacted very quickly, being told what's going on, but the uh, little incident that we had, uh, what, just a week or a couple of weeks ago, where the, uh, uh, is the uh, Muslim family, where there was um, uh, went out and, and the kids were sent back to school, and I think that's Somali family, and the health department and the government were, also, were essentially blaming the family. And yet there was a big expose in the age explaining exactly what happened. And it was completely clear that the health department had fouled up the communication with the family. The family received communication from the department that made it quite clear anyone would have taken it that was quite clear for the kids to go back to school. And the the health department fouled it up again. That was just, what, two weeks ago? Now, that seems to have been the last incident, but there will be incidents again. So here's going to be the real test. There will be some situations that crop up. And how quickly will the health department get on top of those and manage them properly and isolate the situation properly? So the tests are still to come. It's inevitable that there will will be some breakouts. I think we can all hope that after how many months are we now on this is it six months or more i think (laughs) we're into seven months of this uh pandemic uh, in australia and various levels of lockdowns and restrictions let us hope that they have finally got themselves organized to a level equivalent to the other states well we saw in that when the the second wave was beginning to spike and they set up those mass drive-in testi- testing clinics at the the, sh- the shopping centres, there was no clear instructions that once you get tested with symptoms, you need to isolate because, for example, people were getting tested at Chadston Shopping Centre during the, the, the drive-thru and then going into uh, the shop. And look, I, I'm well aware I was involved in managing some situations at some factories. And there was a factory in which I was involved in uh, the management processes around a breakout, very small breakout. It was one person, but the factory had to be closed down. We um, were immediately talking to the workers at the factory and saying, well, go and get tested straight away. And so when they went to get tested, uh, the people who had been in immediate contact with the person who had COVID were tested. But if you hadn't been in immediate contact but had been in the factory, the health department had refused to test them. And they came back to us and we said, go to another health centre and go, 
I've got a cold. And then you'll get tested. So testing of people who were in an immediate environment were being refused. This is this was just incompetence. You know, this a 12 year old school primary school girl would have been able to tell you how to run this better. Right? Because they would have simply applied common sense. And so this was just monumental failures, which reflected some sort of really weird, very, very weird management thinking inside the Department of Health. Goodness knows what it was, but jeepers, we have to get to the bottom of that. You, you, we are in an unsafe situation if we allow the lack of knowledge of this to continue. The only way to create safety for the community is to find out what went on. You only do that by undertaking prosecutions and then you have the learning experience. Uh, there's still the uh, the I stand with Dan people, and and they're also called the the Dan Droids. Who uh, I know that they they one of their defences of Dan. Oh, could you do a better job? Or you just said with that testing situation, a twelve year old uh, uh, schoolgirl could do uh, better. Uh, and so my response always to to these people has been, yes, I could do a better job. Well, look, there, there are the, the groups of trolls and on our, our Facebook page and so forth, we've, we've had a fair sway of these trolls come in and let's just call them political operatives, right? People who are scared that there will be a, a f political fallout from this and the Labor Party will fall and so on and so forth. So put all of those people to one side, right? They're just playing political games. But then take this very large group of people who genuinely say Dan did a good job. They're not politically motivated. They're looking at the situation, say he did a good job. And in a lot of respects, I'll come back to the point before, these people are caught up in the Stockholm syndrome because uh, the politi politicized version of Stockholm syndrome, because what they're saying is there was, a, in their own, there was a complete failure he had to lock us down to stop it. Yes, he did do that. So therefore, it's worthwhile supporting him on that. And I'd agree with them. I think they're, they're being perfectly rational. They're being perfect. You know, you've got to take out all the political operatives out of this. But that very large groups of people who say, look, he did a good job by locking us all down and we eventually got rid of the thing, or we hope we've got rid of the thing. And they're quite correct. Absolutely correct. But then on the other side, if those same people don't turn around and say, oh, yes, but the problem, the unsafetiness of it was caused by this government and we have to get to the bottom of this and find out who and why, well, they are doing themselves a disservice because what they are doing is enabling the state to stay in a very unsafe, uncertain situation, and we can't afford to continue that. So I'll divide those, you know, protect Dan sort of people into those two categories, just the, the political operatives, and good, just go and do your political job. And then the, the other group, which is probably, which I think is very large, who are genuine and they are correct, but they've also got to see the correctness of making sure that we prosecute, we find out the truth. Obviously, well, Peter Credlin has been leading at the, the scrutiny of how this unified security company got this uh, $30 million contract in one day, and it wasn't on the government's uh, approved tender list. Uh, we, we're, we're getting the broader, well, more informed public are getting an idea that this well, th this sort of uh, in inconsistency, if I put it in the, the mildest form, this irregularity is not unique, given that what we've heard in the, the IBAC uh, hearings in the past week about the the kickbacks in the, the Metro and, and V-Line uh, train uh, outsourcing and, and contracts, which is the, the the handing over of money and cash, that's like straight out of a, 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 of a movie. Uh, it's it's breathtaking. 
Uh, if it looks like corruption, smells like corruption, it probably is corruption. And to my mind, uh, I have great clarity on how the decision was made. And it was made through a corrupt process. And in my view, this corrupt process is endemic in this government, uh, that the checks and balances around contract decision making have been corrupted extensively. And I think that the cover up that's occurring, the we don't know, we can't explain it, is a process of trying to avoid the truth around a very corrupt process and a very corrupt situation deeply in the heart of the Victorian government. And it's going to take quite a while for this to be uncovered. And there will be constant processes to try and avoid and stop the truth coming out. And those processes to stop the truth will come from some of the most powerful institutions in this state. Well, one of the new bits of uh, information from Peter Credlin's documentary last night was one of the subcontractors, uh, Andrew McLean from Elite Protection Services, describing the what was referred to as the hot hotel ridges on Swanson Street and the the special treatment that the the Cedar Meats a uh, uh, positive cases were allowed that they couldn't call the police if the uh, Cedar Meats positive case, case cases went uh, walkabouts and when he started to ask questions and that there was a sexual harassment charge levied against his company and then in late May he uh, his subcontract was uh, uh, terminated terminated which is uh, obviously because he was as you were pointing out and uh, he was highlighting mistakes and inconsistencies uh, but they weren't acted upon in fact he was shafted well these weren't mistakes and inconsistencies well they were inconsistencies but they weren't mistakes the given the evidence that he gave the other night these were deliberate decisions now once again you get a situation like that, if it looks like corruption and it smells like corruption, it probably is corruption. I, 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 th I think the word corruption is written all over this stuff. We should, we, you know, we, we've got to face up to reality and, and the, the cover up is on in a huge way. Obviously, we've seen the, the Melbourne uh, press pack for most of the year be uh, pretty uh, well, mediocre to put it lightly. It's taken a non-journalist, uh, Peter Credlin, to start digging. But we 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 saw uh, the our our own anti-corruption body, IBAC. They're they're starting to you would say put the the foot down in uh, holding public hearings. But obviously, the media plays a big role in scrutinising and bringing attention to. The, uh, the other areas of uh, corruption and uh, the awarding of these contracts. So my other question uh, to you in this regard, do you have faith that the media can do a better job going forward in properly scrutinising this government and other contracts that it's, it's given out to connected people? Look, if we don't have in an open democratic society a robust media that drives for the truth, irregardless of the consequences, we have a very weak society. Now, in Australia, we had the breaking open of the scandals to do with the banks happened because of superb, just superb uh, journalistic endeavours and the exposure. The underpayment rorting that was occurring of workers. That happened because of a stunningly good journalistic investigation. And so we have a culture of journalism in this country that does drive for the truth. When the journalistic culture turns around and starts to back off 
because it's dealing with a particular government. And I don't care whether the government is a socialist, an extreme right wing, a middle of the road, doesn't matter. Right? But when you have a, a media that doesn't robustly chase the truth on an issue like this, when you, we saw them chase the truth with the banks and underpayment and so forth, well, the, the media or journalists in it are starting to default to acceptance of an unsafe society. And whatever their political affiliations might be, they have a higher calling both to their profession, to their own careers, but to the hope that we in society hold out for good quality journalists. So I, I hope that they step up to the mark and I know lots of journalists and, uh, and I think ultimately they will. The truth on this is going to, this is a long haul, mm. yeah, a long, long haul. There was two years between the Watergate break-in and Nixon resigning. It was two years. And in the middle of all of that, he handsomely won an election while the while the storm was brewing so this this is big and don't expect none of us should expect this expose and the truth to come out easily it will be extracted very very painfully from the people who ha have a vested interest in keeping the truth hidden yes i agree it's been a a very slow process just to get into the well, the 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 twenty four hour to know that it was twenty four hours when the security contract was awarded. There's still a long way to go to how the decision was ultimately made. Now, the people that you represent at self self employed Australia, they're uh, slowly being allowed to to get back to work now. But uh, as you yourself said, they've been clearly discriminated against uh, during the the second lockdown. Uh, it's been a mixture of uh, the the aid uh, to businesses that have been forced to, to shut down a mixture of federal and state aid. Obviously, the federal government has a, a, a job keeper. Uh, we saw uh, when people weren't isolating when they got tested, Dan introduced the $300 payment. Now it's $450 payment uh, for isolating while you're waiting for your test and fifteen hundred dollar payment uh when you're uh, when you're uh quarantining uh i mentioned uh jim penman's lawsuit do you think that there is a legitimate legal case uh, for people that you represent and the people that jim uh, penman represents to seek compensation for that discrimination look i'm not a lawyer so i can't make a uh, I, I wouldn't dare pass a, a, a view on the legalities of it, but on the pub test, there seems to be uh, inordinately strong reasons for people to proceed. You know, we, we come back to the basic facts. The basic facts are that this was caused by the government. And, and that's not an accusation. That's based on the admissions of the government and all the representatives of the government themselves in the code inquiry. They've admitted that. So stand up to your responsibilities, people. Now, the, the uh, litigation shouldn't have to occur. This should be the government saying, we're opening up a fund. We are going to compensate you properly. You come to us. And we will give you, you know, this is like, like when the churches were finally caught out on the, on the sexual abuse issues and, uh, and the big criticisms of the churches is that the compensation processes they put in place were a sham and then a cover up and all that sort of stuff. That was a whole series of criticisms around that. But really this government's subject to those same criticisms as well. Now, people should not have to go through the process of, of, of going to court to seek compensation when they have been clearly, clearly abused. These people have been abused. And I've 
I've really been quite surprised over the last couple of weeks with some business people that I that I know in our network and you know talk to on on sort of every now and again and and people who are very very good quality business people who know how to get stuck into it and do the job and so forth and are, 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 you know, entrepreneurs and so forth it said to me they're suffering from the black dog you know this is and you sort of go oh what and to get that comment from one and then get it from another and then get it another and another people have seriously sort of you know opened up by the fact that they are they are being treated for depression these are adult business people uh, the, you know the it's pretty serious stuff goodness gracious mm. oh, yeah, we, yeah. We, the, the compensation pro programs the, the, the compensation um litigation program will unfold the government will continue to resist they'll put up defenses they'll do all this sort of stuff and i'll go on and on and on and on and if they were really honest government they would say we're going to start to look after people properly now the, the the unfortunate thing of all of this you know could could bankrupt the state because the the damage has been so extensive as a result of the failures of the government as a result of the decisions of the government that were unsafe practices the, the compensation should be huge well i've got the state budget coming up november uh 24th that'll uh probably uh be quite confronting to to to, to say the the least the uh the black hole that well it was already uh brewing because of all the the cost blowouts in their various infrastructure projects such as the uh the uh, westgate tunnel and uh, there's a few others uh i could and oh the metro tunnel as well the cost blowouts on on that uh as well so it's going to be a grim budget and yeah the the real uh, pain both economic and, and mental as you just mentioned that that'll still unfold for not just the next few months but many years we've got a long a, a long haul on this one uh, a, a very long haul mm. well thank you so much ken for providing your uh expertise and an insight uh, uh the audience has uh, thoroughly enjoyed it uh, as uh, have i am and i'm eager to uh see uh what action uh work safe uh, take by so you said december 19th is when they have to make a decision 29th, 29th of december 29th of september so after christmas we've, we've, we've got a series of things that we're going to do in preparation for that uh, well i'm sure you'll keep us uh informed yeah. about that or well, you've got your your website and uh, you're uh right regularly for the the spectator and so i'm sure we'll hear an update uh from you about that for sure good mm. well take care ken and uh, my best wishes to the people uh you represent as well i'm glad they've been able to get back to work thanks for your time thanks for tuning in to wilmsfront Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.